Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Louis Holbrook. I'll talk to you about postal services over Swarm. Um, I'm part of the Jack team. Jack is a company that's developing um, decentralized marketplace for metadata in the media industry. And Jack is building on Swarm, and we are heavy contributors to the development of the Swarm. Um, before I worked in Jack, though, I did a lot of different things. I was a classical pianist. I was started and edited a cultural magazine. I was a music manager for a while, funding bureaucrat, and uh, also a taxi driver in Berlin for two years. And while driving taxi one day, I picked up these guys in Kreuzberg. Uh, they were totally starstruck because they just met Snowden, and uh, they were blockchain people. And I drove them somewhere. They told me about this bar that they'd been in, in the Bitcoin bar. I didn't even know there existed one, but half a year later, I trotted down there. I met this guy, Victor. And you know, apart from all of these things, all my life, I've been involved in computers like most of you, I presume. And we got into talking about C pointers and really, really nerdy shit. And then he said, look, you have to see something. So he sent me a bunch of these videos of you know, Swarm and, and, um, and uh, saving the world from the clutches of these evil data analysts and stuff. And uh, I was sold, so then we started working, and that's why I'm here in Cancun talking about PSS. So I'm very honored that Victor has trusted and trusted me, the development of PSS. I've been working on this for the last seven months. And um, this talk will be try to explain what makes PSS tick, its internals, but it's also an attempt to, exp uh, to explain it in an easy to understand way so that you don't have to be a total uh, nerd to, to follow the narrative. Um, be sure to also stick around for after my presentation because uh, up then are the guys from Mainframe. They actually built a chat app that's running on PSS and that all of you guys can install and use today. Now, first of all, what is PSS? Well, then we have to ask ourselves what is Swarm, first of all. Uh, by the way, a lot of the examples I'll be using here are going to be pretty contrived. So, you know, real world, uh, real world situation might not look exactly as easy as this, but it's, you know, to try to make it clear. So, Swarm is a network of nodes. And Swarm is a network of nodes that makes it possible to store data without trusting the nodes that are storing it. And since the Swarm network is rooted, it always knows to short the distance from one node to another. Now, everything in Swarm that's stored on Swarm is hacked into chunks. And every piece, every of these chunks, has an address assigned to it, the address being the hash of the piece itself. Now, the chunk is stored at the node that has the most similar address to it. And similar here means that they have as many bits as possible in the start to the address. Now, the same logic is used when retrieving the chunks, of course, since you always, through this logic, know where to look for a particular chunk then there's no need for evil centralized tracking systems and stuff to guide your way. In crude terms, this is what Kademna is rooting all about, is finding the way to the data just by the properties of the data itself. Now, PSS uses the same kind of logic, but for sending messages. So, you know, messages is pretty much just content too, right? But instead of getting the address by hashing the message, the sender actually just adds the address to the message manually. Now, this lets us send any content to any particular location on the Swarm network. And that's exactly what messaging is, of course. To reach its destination, messages are forwarded from node to node. And every one node that forwards compares the address on the message with the address of its respective peers and then forward the message to the peer 
that is closest to the message. All the forwarding nodes compare the first part of the message to figure out where to send them. But if we have less address information, then the address information we need, that we have, probably will match more than one node. That means that by specifying less address information in the message, we can define more than one node as the destination. Of course, we can also just choose to simply omit the address information. And in this case, the message isn't rooted at all. Instead, the message is sent by all peers to all peers. This is, of course, not particularly efficient, but for certain scenarios, it can be useful. Whisper, the existing dark messaging implementation on Ethereum, uses this way to transport messages because it provides full darkness. There's no way of knowing you know, where the messages are going just from looking at the traffic. But, of course, it comes at a great cost. Um, when a message is sent in Swarm, all of the nodes that are forwarding the message are also storing the message on Swarm as a cache. The hash of those messages is used to determine, for example, whether this same message has been seen before. Now, as you can imagine from what previously has been explained, if some nodes wanted to just bomb the network with a bunch of messages, you know, that wouldn't be so hard. So therefore, uh, hard-coded into PSS is this uh, cache mechanism that is a crude, um, a crude version of flood uh, guarding, if you will. So basically what that means is that when a message has been sent through and the message tries to send, let's say, 100,000 of exactly the same message within one second or something, um, they will already have the digest of the message. They hash it again when they get it. They see, oh, this is the same thing, so I will drop this. Since the messages pass, potentially pass through unknown nodes to get to where they're supposed to be, they should be encrypted, of course, so the nodes on the way can't snoop on the contents. This means that the actual definition of a recipient in PSS is not the message, no, sorry, is not the address of the node itself, but it's actually who can decrypt the message. And this isn't necessarily only one node either. If more than, more than one node could decrypt the message, have the required keys, then those, that group of nodes will be defined as the actual recipients. Uh, when we talk about routing in Swarm, we talk about the notion of distances between nodes. This can easily cause some confusion. Because already mentioned, swarm routes by how similar the addresses are to each other. And nodes that are closer in swarm could you know, basically be totally different sites on the globe. So in measuring distance in swarm, we should just forget about, sorry, forget about the notion of geogra geography altogether. When we measure distance in Swarm, we put in a numeric amount on how many bits two addresses shares. So if a node shares the first six bits of an eight-bit address, let's say, then the distance would be two. And if five, then three. And if just one bit, then the distance would be seven. This address that we're talking about is a Swarm overlay address. Now, this address here is not one byte long, it's actually 32 bytes long. It's also randomly generated. That is to say that it's impossible to infer from what information in the node this address is derived. There are other notions of addresses in Ethereum as well. One of them is the P2P e node address, which is a combination of the TCP address of the node, along with a private code, uh, node called the node key. 
In PSS, this is the address to use for step-by-step -step forwarding. Furthermore, every PSS node has its own unique private and public key pair that it uses for encryption. This is currently the same public key as the account paramet parameter that is used when you invoke Swarm. Also, PSS nodes might have any number of symmetric keys for encryption as well. And these can be any arbitrary 32-byte value. So how exactly does the process of forwarding work? Every Swarm node has a hive, and that's the definition of the collection of peers that it's directly connected to. And when you have a message that's to be forwarded, you ask the hive um, about a list of peers that are closer to the message than the peer itself, the node itself. The hive will respond, and the peer with the best matching address is contacted and passed the message. And the same process is continued. Now, how can we make sure that a, the Hive has enough peers so that the message actually can be sent to a closer address? For this, there is the notion of health. And to be healthy, every node has to have a certain amount of peers in various distances. So first of all, we define a number of peers that it has to have in the closest neighborhood. In this case, this is three. This is what it, this we call the prox bin. Now, um, here we see in the next step when we've done some connections that the peer has at least three peers in its closest environment. But that's not enough to be healthy. In addition, in every increment of distances above this, we have to have at least one peer. So this is closer to the node, this is further away. We have three in the closest neighborhood, and we have at least one in the other bin. That's a healthy node. <laughs> and now, since it's healthy, we can be sure that it can forward a message to anywhere in the network. Now, one of the attack vectors for spying powers is traffic analysis. That's to say that if somebody can determine where the message stops, then they could deduce that that particular message was for that node. And therefore, the closer we get to the node the message was addressed to, messages are forwarded to more than one peer. And in fact, that means that messages are forwarded to all the peers in their prox bin, their closest neighborhood. And this is even done by the peer that actually is the intended recipient. So it can decrypt the message, but it also passes it on. So nobody can see where it stops. So what does a PSS message look like? Every message has an address, or not, as we have seen before. An expiry time, a topic, and an arbitrary byte blob. That's the message itself. Actually, PSS uses Whisper's envelope structure for anything but the address field. And it uses whispers methods for encryption of the messages. Encryption can be done using symmetric key encryption, or also public key encryption, in which the message is also signed by the sender. One of the nice features of whisper is the, able to, uh, the ability to pad messages. That means that all messages are guaranteed to be a multiple of certain size. Before encrypting, the message is padded with random bytes up to this limit, this threshold. And it inserts also the first byte, which is the number of bytes that constitute the signing. Actually, there's nothing wrong with embedding some secret information in the padding itself as well. And then you can have a harmless message where the message is expected to be, and hide the spicy stuff where a spy maybe won't look for them. Now, what's the advantages of padding? Well, without padding, all the messages will have different sizes. And a very, very skilled attacker could analyze this pattern and order a messages and determine what the communication is all about. When all the messages have the same size, 
it makes that kind of attack less likely. As we saw before, a recipient of PSS is defined as who can decrypt the message. That means as a sender, we have to store the keys to keep track of our different recipients. And furthermore, these keys may have one or more topic associated with them, which in turn is linked to a swarm or relay address. And keep in mind that it's fully possible also to have, for one recipient to have multiple symmetric keys also. Now, what is this about topics? Topics are what defines what actions to take when you receive a message. PSS has a registration method that links handler code to topics. And in fact, even though this diagram doesn't show it, you can register more than one handler function to each topic, and they will all be executed when you receive a message with that topic. When receiving a message using public key cryptography, we can use the signature to determine which sender, that is, its public key, the message came from. So thus, we know who to send back to when we want to reply. And we might even have some address information on file for this here. <clears throat> we also inspect the topic and pull out the handling code or codes for the topic. And that performs the actual action on the message. With symmetric encryption, it's a little bit different because here there is no signature to inspect. So we basically just go through all the keys until one fits. This is, of course, not so efficient, but uh, PSS has a caching mechanism also here so that the last used key will be the first one that's tried, and then the other ones are tried in chronological order, with the logic being that um, whichever key you last communicated with maybe, you know, is more likely to have sent you the next, the next message. PSS also offers a handshake module, um, which exchanges some ephem ephemeral symmetric keys using public key encryption for the exchange. So when a handshake is initiated, the initiating node sends a number of symmetric keys with an expire account to the peer and requests a number of keys in return. The peer stores the keys it gets, then it generates some keys and sends it back to the peer. Why two collection of keys? In PSS, uh, it's implemented so that one set of the keys is used for outgoing messages and one is used for incoming. So then when one message is sent using one of these keys, the expiry count is decremented. And when it reaches zero, the key cannot be used anymore. So the nodes should switch to different key and ideally also replenish the one that expired. <clears throat> so PSS has an uh, API that can be used through, uh, reached through RPC, that's uh, through sockets or through web sockets. I'll go quickly through some of the methods here, uh, not all of them. So to get the public key of the nodes, the host node, it's this function, get public key. Base address is to get the swarm overlay address of the host node. To make it PSS topic, uh, there is a convenience function for this. You send it a string, you get a topic back. A topic is actually just a four byte value, and it can be any four byte value, but it's kind of defined to be the hash of the first four, four bytes of a hash, specific hash of this. So this is what you get when you call this method. To send the message, you set using um, public key cryptography, you have to set the public key for a specific pair. So you supply the key, of course, you supply the topic, and the address, you know, how much, whatever you want to give or have of that. And then it's just a matter of calling the send asim function with the key, with the topic, and the message itself. The message just being bytes, right? The symmetric key one looks a little different. Um, you have to, in the same manner, set the key, the topic, the address. This is a Boolean that tells, uh, should this key be among the keys you attempt to use to attempt decryption? 
So if you don't put it in there, it won't be put in the pile of the keys that it goes through to match the incoming symmetric uh, message. Um, if you do, then it will. Now, uh, we use Whisper for key handling. And for symmetric keys, Whisper uh, gives you unique string ID. Uh, that's a reference to the actual symmetric key in its backend. So the parameter here is a little bit different. This is then the ID that you get back from this function. Um, so you have to use this when you send a symmetric message. Apart from that, it's the same as the asymmetric one. Now, it's no fun to just talk, right? Uh, you want to somehow sometimes have feedback as well. So to get the incoming messages, you subscribe to, to um, you subscribe through them, through the socket. And this is a pretty simple, as uh, a keyword, a hard-coded keyword, receive, and also the topic for which you want to receive messages for. Uh, if you're implementing this in Golang, by the way, there is a slightly different syntax that you can use. Um, I will defer explanation of this, but it looks like this. As far as handshaking goes, um, you have to activate handshaking on each topic. You remove handshakes from each topic too, you can do that. This is for initiating a handshake, key topic, and a couple of, um, running out of time, so I'll cut it shorter. And get handshake keys, which returns to all the valid uh, handshake keys for a specific topic and a specific pu public key. Now, uh, it's possible also to use PSS as transport mechanism for dev P2P protocols. You can use existing dev P2P protocol code and put it on top of PSS. Now, this quickly turns a bit messy code-wise, so I didn't want to put it here, but at least this is the proof that protocols are possible. Now, a couple of caveats for PSS. PSS is a little bit like UDP. You can't really guarantee that a message will get there. Because the notion of connectivity is just its opinion. It's opinion that it's actually connected to this. It also depends on you know the whole interlocking here. So uh, this needs to be handled in the application layer. Also, since we are the closer you get to a node, the more the message is passed around, the end recipient might end up with more than one copy of the message. Now, there is a small deduplication guard in, 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 in PSS, but we don't guarantee that deduplication will happen in all cases. So mind that as well. And of course, as with anything in cryptography, there is absolutely no guard against stupidity, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not a magic solution. Don't send your key to someone, or et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for future development of, so this is the feature set that's currently in, uh, in PSS now. This will be um, part of PLC3. And um, for further development on the roadmap is a mailboxing function which will say how to store and tell nodes that are offline that a message came to them while they were offline. Uh, we will look at multicasting capabilities, that is to say, uh, simplified routing when, uh, to several nodes when the nodes aren't necessarily in the same address neighborhood. And also um, using PSS to, to modify uh, states and nodes that can be used for, for uh, off-chain uh, database updates and stuff. Um, so the, until this is merged into master, this will be the branch that you use for development. In here is also a full documentation of the API with a few more functions than what I showed now. There is also a peer-to-peer to, peer -peer tutorial that shows a lot of basic step-by-step -step code examples when programming a P2P uh, in Ethereum, and that also includes a bunch of PSS code as well. And lastly, of course, always happy to answer emails or uh, join in on the chat on Gitter. We're pretty much there all the time since we love computers and don't really have other lives, I guess. <laughs> That's it for me, and there are 33 seconds for questions. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah.